Okay. Welcome everyone to the second part of this four part lecture series on the founding of the Beis Yaakov movement. Um, we are going to focus now on Sarah Schneer, her life, and what was the impetus for her to start the Beis Yaakov movement and the whole story surrounding the origins. Um, so let me, I'm going to share again the, the source sheet in the chat, just in case anyone didn't get it the first time around. Um, so so I'll, I'm going to share my screen and I'll show you the, um, the few, I think we only have one picture record, um, documented of Sarah Schneer. So this is the this is a very well known um, painting that people know what she looked like, but this is the only picture that we know uh, documented of Sarah Schneer. So last time we spoke about the situation that specifically Galicia was in in the late nineteenth century, early twentieth uh, century, where there was assimilation, a lot of children were being sent to public schools because of the um, education laws that were passed in the mandatory uh, education acts. There was a sense of a, a basically a breaking down of the connection between the earlier generations and the later. Many um, women were becoming much more, you know, um, secularized and educated than their male counterparts. And there wasn't, there was a, you know, um, a sort of a shidduch crisis, but not in the sense that we talk about it now. There was there were less um, women who were interested in living a traditional lifestyle than there were men. And Sarah Schneer um, found possibly the most important, arguably the most important movement um, of the 20th century when she starts the Beis Yaakov movement. But it really all begins, um, it really all begins for her in 1917, uh, well, it's 1917 is when she founds the school, but um, here. So it really, it really begins for her when she hears a, a rabbi speak named Rabbi Moshe David Flesh. Rabbi Moshe David Flesh, let me just stop sharing for a second. Um, so Rabbi Moshe David Flesh was a, um, a rabbi who was a follower. He was really a student, a third generation student of Rabbi, Sh rabbi Samson Rafal Hirsch, Rabbi Shams Rafal Hirsch. Um, and uh, he studied with Rabbi Solomon Breuer, and, um, who was the son-in-law and follower of Rabbi Shams Rafal Hirsch. And when Sarashir's family went to Vienna to flee from uh, different, you know, different issues that were going on during World War I. And that, uh, you know, we can understand specifically in, in our times right now where people are really fleeing during wartime. So her family ended up in Vienna. Her family really originated from Krakow. Um, she was uh, from a Belzer, Hasidische family. Uh, but she found herself at, uh, at this shul uh, I'm probably mis totally bo um, butchering this pronunciation, but Stumpergas Schul in Vienna in 1914. And in this drasha on Shabbos morning of Moshe David Flesh spoke and he addressed both the men and the women of his congregation. So that was sort of epiphany number one, that she had never seen this in the traditional circles that she uh, was in in Krakow that the rabbi would be addressing men and women. Women came to his synagogue and that was new for her. The number two epiphany was that he spoke the vernacular. He spoke the language that people knew how to speak. He spoke, I, mean, I think he spoke German and uh, he wasn't speaking, um, you know, he wasn't speaking Yiddish, he wasn't speaking Hebrew. I, I think he was speaking German. If I'm not mistaken, but the point that 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 
was impre impre the impression that it was made on Sarshni is that he was, you know, it was sort of, uh, you know, um, a breath of fresh air for her. And this made a great impression on her. And the third epiphany of that drasha, Shabbos morning, it was Shabbos Chanukah, and he was speaking about Yehudis. Yehudis was the great Jewish woman, and he was speaking of her in, you know, heroic terms. And she had never heard, you know, a rabbi speaking positively about a Jewish woman to men and to women and spoken in the vernacular. And this made a deep impression on Sarah Shneer. Now, to get a sense of the type of um, community that she was living in and the sort of the challenges that she was facing and seeing on a day-to-day -day basis, I want to read to you a few uh, um, lines from her, her diary. And this is actually, it's a translation which appears in a different work, but I want to read it to you because I think it's very, it's a very powerful um, excerpt. So this is a, this is source number one in the source sheet, um, which I will again, uh, maybe I'll drop that again in the chat. Give me one second. Let me drop it again in the chat just so that everyone can get it. Um, so she writes this as in her diary and it's translated and recorded in um, a book called Jewish Leaders. As we pass through the Elul days, the months preceding the high holidays, the trains which run to the little shtetlach, the little towns where the Rebbes lived are crowded. Thousands of Hasidim are on their way to spend the Yamim Norayim with the Rebbe, right? Whether it was Belza Hasidim, whether it was Satmer, Ger, they were going to see the Rebbe in uh, Hasidish circles. Often the men would leave their families to go to study or to learn or to daven with the, with the Rebbe or even to just be at the Tish or to see the Rebbe. Every day sees new crowds of old men and young men in Hasidic garb, eager to secure a place on the train, eager to spend the holiest days in the year in the atmosphere of their Rebbe, to be able to extract from it as much holiness as possible. Father and son travel, thus they are drawn to Ger, to Belz, to Alexander, to Babav, to all those places that have been made citadels of concerted religious life dominated by the figure of a Rebbe's personality. And we, speaking of the women, the wives, the daughters, and the little ones stay at home. We have an empty yontif. It is bare of Jewish intellectual content. The women have never learned anything about the spiritual content that is concentrated within a Jewish festival. The mother goes to the synagogue where the services echo faintly into the fenced and boarded off women's galleries. There is much crying by the elderly women. The young girls look at them as though they belong to a different century. Youth and the desire to live a full life shoot up violently in the strong-willed young personalities. Outside the synagogue, the young girls stand chattering. They walk away from the synagogue where their mothers pour out their vague and heavy feelings. They leave behind them the wailing of the older generation and follow the urge for freedom and self-expression. Further and further away from synagogue they go, further away to the dancing, tempting light of a fleeting joy. So first of all, just a very vivid image of, you know, the older women and the, the, the women who just, they were going to synagogue and they were crying, but their, their own daughters were just feeling so distant, so disconnected. The men going off to their, you know, to do their thing. The women without, you know, many of them did not even know how to use a sitter. They didn't have, know how to read Hebrew. And, um, and that's why there's sort of this vague notion of Judaism without any intellectual stimulation, without any spiritual content. And then you have this, this sort of this modernity pulling at you and there's freedom of expression and self, your self-expression and the urge for freedom. And there's really not, it's not much of a battle because it's just so obvious that, these, that there's nothing much in this for them. So that's the life that she was experienced in. And and this Rabbi Moshe David Flesh opened up an entire world for her. And she writes this in her diary that, that it, it opened up a completely different perspective. Um, and she, she tells herself, and she goes back to, uh, she goes, she goes back to Vienna, to, to Krakow, I'm sorry, after this period of time where she studied regularly at Rabbi Flesh's shul with him and his studies. And he was 
uh, as I mentioned, a student of Rabbi Shem Shem Fal Hirsch, and many of the, I would say the Bible almost, of the Besiakov movement in the early days was Rabbi Shem Shem Fal Hirsch's 19 letters, and Chorev, and many of his writings, and his Perish Allah Torah. These, this is a staple of the Besiakov movement, because, mostly because of this early influence that he had, his students had on Sarah um thinking. So she comes back to, to uh, from Vienna in 1915, and she starts a summer youth uh, girls program. So she basically says, "I need to attract the the youth. They're not feeling connected to their to their parents to their older generations." And she starts this youth movement, um, but it really wasn't enough. It didn't really take off. And she writes about how the older girls were already so enmeshed and so um, they were really just assimilated that there was not much that she could do to convince them to stay uh, you know, traditional. So she realizes she has to start younger. It's not enough to start the teens. She has to begin in the younger ages. And in 1917, she starts her own school in her house. Now, remember, this is, um, you know, we mentioned there were certain you know, schools and, and, and there were opportunities in different areas, but traditionally in the, in the traditional circles, this was not done. And um, she starts it in 1917. Now, I'll just want to, I just want to show you this, um, this chart that just, it just shows the, it's really unbelievable. This is the motion of the flesh I just mentioned. And this is the chart of success of the growth of the Yaku movement in Poland. Now you look, this is starting from 1923 and going to 1933. In 1923, there were seven schools. And then by 1933, there were 265 schools. You're welcome. And 37,000 students. It's, just, it's unbelievable uh, the type of you know, growth that, 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 that a base Yaakov experienced. It's really incredible. It's really incredible. So... That, that chart alone should be, really shows you the, whole, the story here. Um, but what, what, what was, we mentioned other, other people. Rabbi, you froze. I'm frozen? Oh. No, you're back. Oh, I'm back. Okay. Okay, we can hear you. Thank you. By the way, everyone's invited if they feel comfortable to, uh, to show their videos. As I mentioned, it, it, I think it adds a lot, but I understand if you're not able to, and if you're doing other things, I totally get it. It's Thursday night. So if, uh, if I could be, a, uh, you know, if I could be uh, here while you're doing other things, I, I'm, 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 uh, that's totally fine. So, uh, oh, so how did she succeed? There were so many things going against her. The society wasn't accepting women of women's uh, Torah study in a formalized structure. The girls were completely unreceptive, and they were pretty much leaving in droves. There were political clashes in different factions, as we mentioned. In, that the, the 1903 rabbinical conference that we mentioned that happened in Krakow, really, even though the, 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 the agenda of women's Torah study was on the agenda, it came up, but nothing could be done. And there were so much, there were so many political divides. How was it that, that Sarah Schneer was able to be so successful when others failed? So um, Naomi Seidman, who I mentioned, uh, is one of my major sources. And she has a very um, a comprehensive book on the Beisiaqa movement. She has a very interesting theory, and I just want to share it with you. Um, so her theory is that we generally think of women, uh, of the fact of the, her gender, right, her being a woman, was um, really a liability, right? She wasn't able, she didn't have that sort of um, the standing in, this, in society. Remember, women's suffrage only becomes... Uh, actually, Poland, ironically, was a little ahead of the Western world. It was a year ahead. So in Poland, I think they had women voting in 1918. But in 1915, 1916, 1917, is before women were even allowed to vote. So we generally think the fact that she was a woman and she was starting her own institution in her own house, it was a liability. And here she was, a seamstress. Um, you, know, what, what she, you know, she did have an eighth grade education, which, by the way, was very rare in those days up to eighth grade is, is considered, you know, significant. So, but we, we uh, Naomi Simon argues that it actually was not a liability. It was actually a, um, a great benefit to her because 
it gave her the benefit of marginality. Because if she had been sort of a rabbinic figure, if she had been a male, she would have gotten into sort of the center. She would have gotten involved in, in some of the, in, in the, the divides. And she would have had to take sides and she would have been more of a divisive figure. But because she was a woman, she was able to sort of operate outside of the normal structures and frameworks that men had typically taken up. And therefore, she, because she was outside of this infrastructure of the normal communal you know, um, domain, so she avoided political clashes. She didn't confront them head on. We actually know, we don't, there's a famous teaching which we will do together hopefully um, about the permissibility or really the prohibition of women studying Torah. And we'll talk about how the Chavetz Chaim, this, uh, you know, how he understands that Gemara not to be relevant to our times. But she, we know that this is a very important uh, source when it comes to women in Torah study. And we know that Sarah Shneer was a very learned woman. But nowhere in her writings do we see her contending with this particular story. To my knowledge, she never writes about it. Why? Why does she take on this issue head on? Because she realized that it was much more beneficial. It's, I don't think it was just happen sense. I think she picked up on the fact that working outside of the system, working in the margin, so to speak, was to her benefit. And she was a very pious woman. And she did, and she she wanted to, um, she never wanted to challenge the rabbinic establishment. There were a woman who she, we mentioned last time, a Bertha Pappenheim, who was actually, we'll talk about her influence on Beis Yaakov, spoken. She was critical of the rabbinate. She talked about the problem of Agunos. And I'm not, I'm not taking a side on, on this issue. I think there were many reasons we could even refer to Bertha Pappenheim as a, as a hero. But one thing that Sarah Schneer did, which I think was, was, at least Simon argues, was a secret for her success, was she never took on any institution straight on. She just did her thing. She, she did her thing. She taught girls uh, Torah. She inspired people. And, and, and the, she didn't get involved in these infightings. And she, because of her gender, specifically, it was actually an asset because it gave her this ability, this benefit of marginality. I think it's a, it's a, I never had thought of it. I think it's a brilliant idea. I, I can't prove it. It's just a theory, but this is Simon's theory of how she was able to um, sort of function outside of the normal structures and yet not um, draw attention and not draw controversy. So did you say she taught the girls herself? Yeah, she started the school. She taught the girls. It was in her house. Yes, yes. So how did she get educated? So it seems that she read she started going to these shiurim, these classes from Rabbi Flesh. Um, but- um, Rabbi, it, you froze again. Oh no, that's not good. Not frozen on mine. Oh, I don't know. Not either. It may be, may be their computer because you're fine with me. Oh, okay. Sorry. It's a good question. Um, it appears that she, like we saw from that excerpt of her diary, I mean, she had a real ability to write and- um, her pen, you know, was just, uh, she was able to write really poetically and she was very in introspective. Um, it's a good question. I don't know. It, it appears from her writings that she had an education, she had, as I mentioned, up to eighth grade. And she was a very pious woman. They uh, actually called her, uh, you know, Chasidka. Chasidka, someone mentioned it last time. I think it was um, Tali Weber. In, in English, it doesn't really translate over, but it means like little Miss Chasid which is kind of a pejorative. Like they would make fun of her. She's so from, she's so pious. And um, it, it appears that she did have an education. Um, she went, she didn't go to, uh, you know, she went to, I think, public school. Um, that's where, you know, there weren't any real formalized uh, structures or, or traditional Jewish schools. Um, so I meant, I think she went to public school, but I, I'll look more into that. Um, okay. So basically Sarah Schneer becomes this informal sort of rebbe, almost like a, a leader of her of her girls, because she was she was um, she was a divorcee. She was not married anymore at that point. Um, she actually writes about her um, her wedding, you know, before her wedding, and how she feels that she's you know she's not excited, and it's a, it's actually a very um, sad uh, entry in her diary. 
um, which Seidman has a piece in, in sort of a uh, part two of her book is, is, is Sarah Schneer's diary. So she was divorced at this point. She does remarry later in life, uh, briefly. Um, she does die young, unfortunately, in 1935. But basically between 1917 and 1935, she launches this unbelievably successful, almost unimaginably successful movement. Um, I'll show you a picture also, just to get a sense of it over here. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is a picture of the Beis Yaakov over here. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, we really don't have any pictures of Sarah Shmir besides that one that I showed you earlier. So now we, let's move fast forward a few years. She has, uh, you know, maybe, a, let's go, I think it's around 1918 at this point. Um, although the years over here are, are not 100% ironed out because there was no formal letter that was written. Uh, but there was a very important meeting that happens around this time that Sarah Schneer is starting her, her movement, and she's picking up steam. She's avoiding the, the sort of the, the, the political clashes. But her brother says to her, and again, remember, she, her family comes from a Belzer uh, background, so very traditional. So her brother tells her, I, I don't think what you're doing is, is, is a good idea. Now, he doesn't say that the reason is a bad idea is because it's, it's us, sir, it's forbidden for teaching women Torah. No, no. He says, I don't want you getting involved in, this, in these political debates. I, I think it's a bad idea. So basically, he tells her, I don't think you should do this. Now, she is not convinced. And he pushes her that, you know what, at least let's go to the Belzer Rebbe. Now, he thinks, ostensibly, that if they go to the Belzer Rebbe and they ask, can we start this new movement that's never been done uh, to teach women Torah, he's for sure going to say no. So he figured, let's go to the Belzareva. He'll say no, and that'll be the end of it. So they go to the Belzareva, and um, they write, a, you know, they write a uh, a tzetl or a kvittel. It's probably a tzetl. It's a, I think a kvittel is to for you. A tzetl is just a, a letter, a little note. And um, so the Belzareva of Yisachar Dov Rokeach, he sees the letter or the little right, and we don't know the exact formulation of this letter um this the, we don't have any record of it but we it was something along the lines that they asked my you know my sister the, the brother wrote my sister wants to educate you know Yisrael, and this is a, a uh, um in the torah world this is source number three um my sister wants to educate you know in the spirit of yadis and torah very vague he kept it vague he didn't want to talk about exactly what's going to happen and he didn't exactly lay out what was the plan and and, and you know very general. Um, that's that seems to be the, the theme in, in much of the writing. This is a Rav Yosef, Yosef um, Friedensen, who is a son of. We'll talk about Gershon's Friedensen, who was a very active uh, in the early stages of um, of the Beis Yaakov movement. He was, an, he was a Ger Chassid. So they wrote this work over here, the Torah world. And so in this in this uh, sort of the this form of the story. The, the, uh, the, this was the, the message to the Belzer Rebbe. The Belzer Rebbe says what Rabbi Mordechai Willig told me was the two most important words uttered in the 20th century. Baruch <laughs> HaVehatzlacha. Blessings and success. And at that point, Sarah Shneer had what she needed. She felt, and her brother obviously felt, that this was enough. That the Rebbe said Baruch HaVehatzlacha. Now, I want to just clarify something. Again, she started the school without without asking, right? It wasn't as though it wasn't as though she didn't know what to do. She went to the Belzer Rebbe and he told her to start a school. She started the school. She was pushed to go ask. Then she asked. The Belzer Rebbe gives the blessing. Now he doesn't lend active support, and we'll talk about the active support that um, that comes later. The Belzer Rebbe does not lend any active support. He does not give any fis fiscal uh, support, financial support. He doesn't even allow his own community to attend the schools. He says, not for us, not for our daughters, but he does have, she gets the blessings. She has his blessing, and that is very significant. Now, um, the next step, I think, in the story is really when the Agudas Yisrael, the early fledging uh, um, political organization of, of traditional orthodox, uh, you know, I would say, Orthodox, you know, uh, institution, but we'll talk about it was a, it was a, it was a, um, a specific form of how orthodoxy and sort of a political body came together. 
I'll try to give a little bit of background about it. But for now, um, just it's important that when that when the, a good yeah, is doing a thing on the history of Beisakov. Yes, history of Beisakov. Oh, sorry. Yes. So no problem. So um, so what what really gets everything going and what really gives this push for Sarashner's movement to succeed is when the Aguda Sisral begins to back uh, begins to back Beis Yaakov. So in 1912, just to give a little background on Aguda Sisral and what, what they were and what, what they were about. So in 1912, the Aguda Sisral is formed by Jacob Rosenheim at uh, the historical conference at Katowice. Now, this organization in its fledgling stages was not what we know it to be today, where it's involved in the Siam Ashas and it's involved in government advocacy and all these things. It was really just a fledgling organization. And two important names that we should know about the formation of, of Agudas Yisrael are Rabbi Dr. Emanuel Karlbach and Rabbi Dr. Pinchas Cohen, two rabbi doctors coming from the world of German orthodoxy end up in Poland. How do they end up in Poland? Because they were in World War I working for the German occupation in Poland. So they end up in World War I in, in, in Poland. And they meet the Ger Rebbe. The Ger Rebbe, Rebbe Avram Mordechai Alter, who we will talk uh, at length about uh, his involvement in, in, uh, in Beis Yaakov. They meet him in 1916, and they found an organization called the Agudas Yisrael of Poland in Warsaw. And this partnership between, I'll try to just speak broadly because I want to get to the, the you know, um, there's a lot of history here and um, there's a long story with the whole Agudas and Yisrael and their role and how they, how they worked and how they functioned. But one thing that I want to just, uh, um, one thing that was very key to their success was a partnership between, as I mentioned, the, the German Orthodoxy and I guess more Eastern European um, Polish Orthodoxy of, of the Gera Hasidim. So the partnership between the Yekas and the Hasidim was the, the, the basic, the, 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 the strongest point of, of, Aguda, of the Aguda movement. They had the organization of the Yekas and they had the wherewithal and the, and the innovation and, the, and, the, and the, the power of numbers through, um, through Ger and the Gera Rebbe's vision. The Ger Rebbe, probably earlier than anyone else, backed um, the, the, uh, the founding of Beis Yaakov. Now, he doesn't do it. We don't have any um, uh, uh, a letter at, in these years. He writes a letter uh, later, we'll see, in, in, in 1926 or 27, I have to look. But early on, nothing happened in the Aguda without the Ger Rebbe. Nothing in, in the Aguda in, in Poland happened without his approval. And... And it was very, it was a very significant um, piece in the story of the success of Beis Yaakov. And I'll show you in source number four. This is a, um, this is a statement from 1922, um, and it was a, uh, it's sort of a recording of the Agudas Yisrael's um, mandate. In, uh, in 1922. So let me, I'll share my screen. I'll read a part, piece of it with you. So this is a few years after the, uh, the local Agudas Sistra of Krakow decides to back Sarashnir in 1919. But this is one of the earlier sources that actually document the Agudas Sistra's support. And this is sort of a, an agenda of one of their conferences. And they write over here that one of their goals, the 11th goal, is to educate the daughters in the spirit of Yiddishkeit and to learn with them from their early childhood some of the words of Torah and Musr and commensurate with their age to continue to learn with them the obligations in such a manner that when they reach their age of marriage, they will be easily accept the obligations pertaining to the priority of the Zara. Okay, so you see, it's, you know, it's, it's a very traditional and somewhat limited, but it's a formal documentation of their support of the Torah studies for women. Okay, now, um, in 1923, so we just, so let's just give a, I give a timeline. So 1917, Sarah Schneer starts her school. 1919, the local Aguda starts to back it. 1923, 
in the first world Aguda Sisral conference, now it's not just the Ger Rebbe with these with the with some of the um, German Orthodox rabbis and a little bit more and, and their and their peers. Now we have a larger organization, and they call together the first world congress of the Aguda Sisral in 1923 in Vienna, and they establish um, something called the Karen HaTorah. The Karen HaTorah was an organization which funded basically uh, was the funding of the Beis Yaakov movement. And they, they decided to take on the fiscal responsibilities of the Beis Yaakov movement. And they appointed Dr. Leo Deutschlander as the chairman or the director of this organization called Karen HaTorah. Now, as I mentioned to you, even before um, this happened, the Gera Rebbe was, was for sure on board, but now certainly the Gera Rebbe was actively supporting um, through his organization, the, the Aguda Sisral was, was actively financially supporting the, uh, the movement of Beis Yaakov. So not only did they just have this blessing from the Belzer Rebbe that happened in the early 19-teens, we have in 1923, the formal acceptance of the movement and financial uh, responsibilities taken on by the Aguda Sisral. This is a picture going a little bit six years uh, um, ahead from 1929. This is a Nishay Aguda Sisral. They formed in Nishay, which is a women's uh, sort of organization. And this is the, uh, the dais. And you have on the dais, you have the, the wife of many, many illustrious uh, distinguished leaders in the Haredi or, or Eastern European and, and, and uh, world. So you have the wife of Rav Avram Mordechai Alter, the Gera Rebbe, his wife, um, Rebetzin uh, Fega Minshe Alter. You have the wife of Chaim Ozer Grzynski, who was the chief rabbi of Vilna, probably the Gadol Hador of the Litvish world, of the Lithuanian world. So his Rebetzin, his wife was there, Rebetzin Lea Grzynski. And you have many others, many others, but those are some famous ones. And, um, and they created this organization of Neshe uh, Aguda Sisra in 1929. Um, now, at this point, things really start to, 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 uh, to succeed. You, we have people like Rabbi Dr. Leo Deutschlander, who was, uh, again, a German Jew. And he was a very key piece of the success of Beis Yaakov. Um, he was, as I mentioned to you, the, uh, took a leadership role in Aguda and directed and, and basically found, founded and ran their organization of the Karen HaTorah of the Aguda Sisral, which was not only a financial piece of it, he also helped with the educational curriculum and taught in the schools and in, the, uh, in some of the teacher seminaries in their summer programs. And he was uh, a very, prof he worked and professionalized the Beis Yaakov movement. Um, and he, uh, uh, you know, he was very um, sought after in their, in, their, uh, in their teachers seminary, as I mentioned. And he visited those campuses and, um, and he lectured in them himself. Um, another very important piece and another, as I mentioned, uh, the, the Ger Rebbe was, was important. Many of his followers, Ger Hasidim, we think of, you know, Ger was a very traditional, very Hasidish, very uh, old school, you may, have, you may think, but there were many Ger Hasidim who took a very active role early on in the Beis Yaakov movement, movement. And one of them was Eliezer Gershon Friedensen, like I mentioned to you, his son wrote, wrote that book later on. And he was an activist in the Aguda movement, and he was a writer. And he did many uh, important um, things for the Beis Yaakov movement. Number one, he edited the Beis Yaakov journal from its inception until 1939. He was the driving force behind Benos Aguda Sisral. Benos was a youth movement that we'll talk a little bit about how it built the culture of Beis Yaakov and how it created its own uh, symbolisms and its own sort of um, its own culture. And um, he also opened up a Beis Yaakov publishing uh, company. And he was also the director of a, of a women's vocational training institute, 
which they later renamed Oel Sara. And when, once uh, Sarah Shir passed away, they named it Oel Sara. Another Ger Chosid, who, again, look at the, these are like traditional people that you would think, okay, they, what, would they, what, what would they have part in this, uh, you know, new women's revolution? And this was Rabbi Yehuda Leib Orlean. Rabbi Yehuda Leib Orlean, another Ger Chosid, who um, remained a Ger Chosid for the, his entire life, um, he also was very involved in um, developing the philosophical and, um, and educational ideologies of Aguda in its early stages. And as part of his activities in Aguda, he served as the director of the Bisiako school and uh, it was at 37 Tuarda Street. That was the one that Sarashnir opened. And um, he actually takes over, Sar after Sarashnir passes away, he takes over and leads the school um, in 19, I think it was actually in 1933. Um, so a little before she, but when she was got sicker, that's when he um, took over 1933. Um, unfortunately, he was he was his life was taken in in Birkenau by the Nazis, but he was also a very very important. Um, player and activist in the Beis Yaakov movement. And not last for us, but not least for sure, Judith Rosenbaum, who later becomes Grunfeld. She was one of the star students of Sarah Schneer. And she was um, very just charming and very um, articulate. And she would go around. And again, all these women, we have to just remember what they were doing. They were young women with very little um, experience founding schools. They were literally going into these towns. They would send them with a few students. Hey, go to this town, knock on doors, tell people you're starting a school in someone's house. So she would go and persuade, um, you know, people to join the, the movement. She was very, very successful. In fact, in 1925, um, so uh, she planned to move to Israel. And Rabbi, Rabbi Jacob Rosenheim, who I mentioned to you, was the founder of the Goodest Israel. He convinced her to uh, not move to Eretz Yisrael and go to Poland and basically join forces with Sarah Schneer. And that was the point and from 1925 to around 1932. She worked hand in hand with Sarah Schneer and she was very much a, a, a staple of, of the schools and, um, and their success and the general um, fundraising and, and, and spreading of the Bisiako vision. As I mentioned to you, Bertha Pappenheim, so she was also a very important piece in, um, in Beis Yaakov, and, and she met with Dr. Leo Deutschlander, and she took a very strong interest in Beis Yaakov. She felt that it was addressing a lot of the problems we mentioned about, about um, human trafficking and prostitution, and she felt that this, the education of the girls is going to really solve that problem, and she took a very active role in the organization. Um, skipping ahead around 12 years from its inception. Um, so you have, so 1929, we have the Ger Rebbe's first letter. Around 1928, 1929. And he writes a, a letter explicitly supporting the Beis Yaakov movement. And I have it over here in source number five. He says you should help them with money and you should, be supportive and um, basically uh, giving his signature and his approval. We also have a letter in 1930 from Rav Chaim Ozer who I mentioned to you as one of the Gedoli Hador, one of the great leaders of Lithuanian Jewry. I won't read this whole thing inside with you. And in 1933, the famous letter of the Chafetz Chaim, who uh, writes in explicit support of a particular community in Fristak, to support the, the, the Beis Yaakov. And the question is, I don't understand. This movement has been around for 10, 12, 15 years already. Why are the rabbis writing these letters of support? So Yehuda Geber and also Simon, Naomi Simon point out that it appears that there were still murmurings of, uh, of criticism, even 10 years after the movement had begun. And that's when Sort of, we have these formal support and uh, proclamations 
of these of the of the of the you know the Chavetz Chaim's letter of support is is very famous and it's important. However, it only is coming after the proof the proof is in the pudding. In other words, Sarah Schneer's students, her movement, her success is the greatest proof of why we should support this. And that's really when uh, the, the Rabbanim felt uh, compelled to write, because at this point, even though the Aguda already supported them from the, you know, 1923, as early as 1923, but there were still naysayers, and therefore they had to write these letters of support. Um, so there's, a, there's an important piece in, in, in this, and that is um, the topic of women's Torah study and the permissibility of that. And why, like we may, we may frame it this way, why was there such a hesitation? Why was there um, the pushback? I mean, we see, as we mentioned last time, I mean, there, were, there was assimilation, there was so much um, disconnection between the older generations and the younger. And women were leaving the fold in droves. There were issues of, of human trafficking. Why? And then all of a sudden, no, we're not going to teach them any Torah. So why was there such a strong um, criticism and hesitation to support women's Torah study? So part of it has to do with, not all of it, but part of it has to do with the fact that there is a, a, a halachic issue, potentially, with the, the women studying Torah. So I want to just, um, I want to do a few sources with you. This letter of the Chavetz Chaim is when he formally supports the movement, but there's really a, something that he writes 10, even 12 years before this letter in a footnote to one of his other works that is very important in this topic. So I want to just share it with you. I'll just give me a second where I pull it up. Um, Some people get confused between these two letters because it's uh, they're both written by the Chavetz Chaim and they're both about women studying Torah. But in 1933, he writes a formal letter supporting the movement of Beis Yaakov. But in 1921, he writes in a footnote to the Lakute Halachos, which was his work on um, it was his work on the different halachos, you know, that were, he, he basically structured it like similar to the riff. Uh, the riff, Rabbeinu Yitzchak al organized the halachos that are derived from the Gemara. And he said, we need to codify them. We need to sort of um, just uh, give the basic bottom line halacha. And it's not, it's not enough for people to just have the Gemaras, we need to we need to have a formal sort of codification of, of, of halacha. And the Chavetz Chaim did this with a lot of different Gemaras, and he did it for a Masechta, Masechah Sota. And in this Masechah Sota, uh, Lekutei Halachos, the Chavetz Chaim writes in a, a very rare footnote. He writes as follows. I'll make it a little larger for you. So, Without going to all the nitty gritty details, Rabbi Eliezer in Sota says that it's prohibited to teach um, your, one's daughter um, Torah. And the Chavetz Chaim says that it must be that this was not intended for our times. And I'll just read this line for you here. It appears to me that all of this, in other words, all of this, this notion that women's Torah study is prohibited was all from the previous generations. That every single person lived in their father's place. The Kabbalas Ha'avos means not just father, it means you know, ancestors. The Kabbalas Ha'avos Ha'yachazak Ma'od. And the ancestral traditions were very strong. For every single person. For a person to go and to be motivated to act in the ways of their forefathers. Ask your parents, ask your father, and they'll tell you. 
And in this situation, we could say that a woman may not study Torah. How could she not study Torah? Doesn't she need to know the halachas that, that are relevant to her? So yes, so that's for sure true. And um, without going into all the details, she would have to know the halachas that are relevant to her. The Chavetz Chaim is referring to even going beyond that, even just going into learning things to, for edification, for, for spiritual goals. And he says, in those times, it could, have, it could be said, it could be said that you, shouldn't, you don't have to teach them. There were individuals who, women who were always, uh, you know, broke from the general trend and they studied Torah on their own, but formalizing it and teaching them that, he says, we could rely, and it could be in those times that those, that women in general, not the exceptional cases of people who did rise above and, and choose to, to study Torah on their own, but the general framework, it was enough for them to rely on their emulating their parents' righteous ways. At this time, when our generation is exceptionally weak because of our sins, he says, that this ancestral tradition is very weak. People don't even live in their parents' areas, parents' places. And certainly those who are accustomed, have accustomed themselves to studying the, the written and the language of the, the written uh, works and the language of the non-Jews. It's a great mitzvah to teach them Chumish, Nevi'im, Ksuvim, and the Musr, and he quotes a, a few other things that I wrote over here, just um, uh, in the English there, Pekri Avos, Menorah Samor, different Sfarim, Kedesh, Yis Ames, Etzlam, and Yanam, and Munas Senu, in order for them to internalize our sacred faith, uh, Kedosha, our sacred faith, De'ilav Hachi, Alosh Yisuru, Legamri Midera Hashem, that God forbid they will be completely lost the path of Hashem. They will leave completely. They will abandon and desecrate, violate all of our fundamental fundamentals of our religion. So the Chavetz Chaim, it, it, it's interesting. It sounds like if you were just to read this Chavetz Chaim um, on its own, the... It's almost like a, an argument of reform. The, the Gemara says it's forbidden, and the Chavetz Chaim says it's a mitzvah. What is this? Well, how can you possibly understand this? So if you, we didn't know anything about the Chavetz Chaim besides this letter, then maybe you could come to that conclusion that the halacha changes, and we could apply what works in our times, and that's it. But we know the Chavetz Chaim was an extremely traditional thinker, and he actually is on, on record criticizing uh, you know, different forms of luxury. He thought that uh, people were, you know, too spoiled and he actually blames the women specifically that they w want so, you know, they want so many fancy, uh, you know, things and has to cause their husbands to work more and therefore they can learn less. And he has some, you know, you know, harsh things to say about, you know, I would say uh, uh, definitely not in the camp of m modernity and certainly not in the camp of reform. So what, in, what was the Chavetz Chaim uh, saying over here? So it appears clear, I'm, I'm, I'm using Rabbi Meir Torsky, who is the, the grandson of Rav Soloveitchik, one of his articles and sort of his line of thinking. That it must be that the Gemara that said that women may not study Torah, or more correctly to say one should not teach them Torah, was referring to, must not have been referring to a situation in which it was necessary to teach them Torah. When it becomes necessary, when, when it's untenable not to teach women Torah, it doesn't, it's not that there is a prohibition and we're now circumventing the prohibition. It's not, it was never intended as a prohibition at all. The prohibition was only intended when it was sort of extracurricular or it was enforced or obligate, made obligatory for women when it wasn't obligatory. But now that we see that it's required and it's crucial for their spiritual edification and their development, 
in, in our society, it's clear that this halacha was never intended for our situation from the get-go. It's not that it was important. Like driving the shul on Shabbos was always, well, they didn't have cars in those days, but you know, making a fire on Shabbos was always forbidden. And now we're saying, okay, well, times change and we need to justify it. No, the Gemara never was referring to our, uh, to our situation. It was never referring to a situation in which the, 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 the need for women studying Torah was not coming from uh, you know, uh, uh, us imposing it on them. Like it says, us are lament bito Torah. It's forbidden for some, for some of them to teach their daughter Torah. But for them to, to, to desire it and to learn it and, and, and for them to, and for us, to, we see that it's so crucial for their edification. It must be that the Gemara was not referring to this situation. Now it's very, it's a, it's a radical point, but I think that's the point that Chavetz Chaim is making. And, and um, I'll just note again, Sarah Schneer's gender may play a factor into this piece. Now, the Chavetz Chaim is writing a footnote in a halachic work. So it's not, it, I don't mean to say this, that is that he had any intention of telling, you know, uh, the world about this and promoting it. He did write a letter in 1933, a few months before he passes. But this footnote is not meant for the masses. However, I think it does depict sort of what the general consciousness of people, where it was at and where people in the traditional circles, what were they were thinking. So it appears from the Chavetz Chaim, and this is what I think Simon makes this point as well, that it was again her gender, which was to her advantage. It was just, it was a woman teaching other women Torah. So again, it's the formal prohibition was on men teaching daughters Torah and teaching them in a sort of a, as I mentioned, like Rav Torsky said, in a obligatory or um, required type of curriculum, compelling them to learn when they didn't want to study. And that we thought was not appropriate. But here we have Sarah Schneer, who was a woman teaching women. So she avoided the problem altogether because it wasn't, again, the context of the Gemara. It wasn't what the Gemara was talking about. And as you noted, the proof was in the pudding. She was clearly being success successful. She was clearly gaining uh, you know, a following. She was a very pious woman. She was not, um, you know, she was not um, trying to head on challenge Rabin, although, as I mentioned, her success and her she does go to the Belzareva, but it wasn't like that was her main concern, what the rabbinic thinking was, what, what they were saying. She it was a grassroots movement. It, it did um, gain much from the support of the Aguda. And, and I think um, that partnership is crucial to understanding the story of Beis Yaakov, that it, had it just been her on her own without any rabbinic support, I don't know if she would have been able to financially remain solvent. I mean, the, the Karen Atora and Dr. Leo Deutschlander and his help with the educational curriculum and, and to professionalize it and, and all the Gera Rebbe's uh, Talmidim and, you know, um, Rabbi Huda Leib Orlian and all these figures, it was a very important piece in the story of, of, of the success of Yaakov having this partnership with the Rabbanim and the Aguda leadership. With all that said, it was a grassroots movement. So, I would say maybe to, to, to close with two, two thoughts, and I think we'll have to continue this uh, later because we didn't get to the culture of Beis Yaakov and we didn't get to sort of what they created and the productions and the plays and the theater, but two closing thoughts uh, from tonight's um, lecture. So number one, it was a very important, as I mentioned, a very important partnership between the lay, we'll call it lay leadership. It wasn't even lay leadership. It was just sort of a, almost a nobody, right? We, we, we think of, uh, of people today who are divorced and they're sort of on the outside of society. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes I think it's, it's, it's not a positive thing, but people in those generations forget stigma. I mean, it was just, you didn't have a voice. She on the outside of, of, of the normative frameworks starts a movement, grassroots movement and pretty much on her own. She does have this blessing from the Bells of Rebbe. It could have just been that, but there was the success, I think, lay in this um, merging of, of both the traditional structure, which had its issues, 
as we saw clearly, they weren't getting their act together. They weren't able to produce what Sarah Shneer was able to do to actually formulate an educational plan and, an, and, a, and, a, and a movement. So they were just not able to do it and she was able to do it. However, however, you needed both. You needed a partnership of this of the rabbinic establishment along with the people and the innovation of Sarah Shneer. So I think that's a very, I think, important lesson for us in today's um, uh, demographics and in today's world as well, that there are things that, you know, everyone can contribute. And there are things that, um, you know, the rabbis to say that they can do it all on their own is just, it's just arrogance. It's not, they don't have the wherewithal and they don't have their ears to the ground sometimes. And they clearly weren't able to do what Sarashir was able to do. At the same time, there has to be a partnership. So that's, I think, one takeaway that we can have from this, this story. Um, and the other takeaway, we'll get to more of this later, and I think it's just it's a tremendously inspiring story of what an individual can accomplish. I mean, we have Sarah Schneer goes to this shear by Rabbi Moshe David Flesh, and she's inspired, and like, you know, it could have ended there. But that individual, Sarah Schneer, what she was able to do, how she changed the face of orthodoxy in, 19, in, the, in, the, in the 20th century. And, and, and really on her own. I mean, she starts the school, she recruits, she will talk about, she started a teacher seminary because there were no teachers to teach the students because nobody knew anything. So she, she did everything on her own. And um, as I started the whole series off, that was what, uh, in that story of Noah Weinberg in the beginning of Carry Me in Your Heart, quotes from Rav Cheskel Sana that he said at this bris that, that, she did more for orthodoxy than any of the people here as grandfather, right? She did more for the saving of the entire community uh, as an individual, as someone who was completely committed to the, to the movement. She had no agenda other than the growth and the success of her students and the and Jewish women. And we owe her pretty much our legacy of, our, of the continuation of orthodoxy. And that, was, that is the power of an individual. Often we think, what can one person do, right? What, what can I do? I see this problem and the rabbis don't know how to deal with it. The people don't know what to do and it's never been done. And we, you know, sometimes it's true. Sometimes we can't do it, but sometimes we can. And so our story is a clear indication of the power of that one person and the difference one person can make. And also rabbi, the brave yes. people who stood beside her Right, the ones who you mentioned right. that came up to her and gave her chizuk. Yes, yes, the the Belzareba first and the Chavetz Chaim, and yes, absolutely, they did. You know, they did come ten years later, but we have we have to assume, and we'll see some sources next time. We have to assume there was criticism because there usually doesn't have to be a letter of support for something that had no detractors, right? So there were probably people who were criticizing. And, um, and we'll see some of that next time. But I, I wanted to focus a little bit more on the positive and to explain how she was so successful. Um, Rabbi, you're frozen again. Okay. Okay, well, if it, uh, thank you everyone for coming. Um, and um, it, was a, it, was, uh, it was nice to see, every, see some of you and uh, have a wonderful night. Thank you for, for uh, you know, Thursday night is not the greatest night, so I appreciate the flexibility. We're going to be continuing this Tuesday, if I'm not mistaken, um, and then we're going to take a break for, for Purim. So we'll, we'll have the third, the third uh, segment of this series on this Tuesday, and then we'll take a break, and then a week later we'll do the last piece. Okay, everyone have a great night and good Shabbos. Can I ask a question? Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay, so what was their curriculum? Because um, it said, you know, they learned Torah. They didn't learn Mishnah, but did they learn any halacha, shulchan orach, anything, you know? So you're referring to what the Chavetz Chaim was saying there? In that, right. So the Chavetz yeah. Chaim said that it's a great mitzvah to teach them Chumash, Nach, and uh, he mentions a few other yeah. works of Musser. Yeah, so Kirky yeah, Alvos, right. So that's not a curriculum. That was just the Chavetz Chaim, what he was giving as examples for things that was a great mitzvah to teach. Um, what they learned was actually 
based on the principles of Rav Sham Shemfal Hirsch, Torah and Derech Eretz. They learn both secular studies as well as Torah. And very much in the, in the, in the um, spirit of Torah and Derech Eretz, which was a uh, combination of, of secular studies and, uh, and Torah. They did not learn Gemara, but they, it, it appears that they studied, we know they studied the 19 letters of Rav Shana Shemfal Hirsch. We know they learned Chumash. Uh, we know they, they learned Tanakh and Tehillim was a very um, large focus of Sarashnir. Um, I, I don't know, like on a, an, a, like a broad spectrum of like a lot of the schools were really dealing with different types of students. So like Vienna was different than Krakow and, and, you know, Galicia was different than um, other places, you know, like say um, Hungary was, well, that's a little bit similar, but, you know, different communities were, were different. And, um, but often they would, they would comply with, with the educational requirements of their city. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about Brisk, how um, the Yisachov and Brisk was started and they had, uh, you know, these government officials coming in and, and testing the girls. And I have a, a story about that, but um, they, you know, they didn't, I think they, they definitely studied halacha in, in the sense of what was practical, what you need to know, but it was, it was less um, theoretical. It was much more like on a practical level, um, but there was a range of different things, different schools, and and um, focus on Chumash, focus on Torah Shabbat Sav, and um, and Rav Shem Shem Hirsch's model. Also, are you going to talk about uh, what happened here in North America, Toronto? I know my mother; she was born and raised in Toronto, and uh, she never learned when she was young how to read Hebrew at all. Wow! She learned wow. when she was an adult. That's unbelievable. Yeah, so the actual the literacy level of Jews was higher in, in Poland than in, in, than in the non-Jewish world. But even for men, it was only, uh, I think, six out of 10. So 60% were literate for men. Um, women were lower on that spectrum. Um, but yeah, that's, I'm going to talk a little bit about North America, the founding of Beis Yaakov in uh, New York. God willing, um, but I don't have so much on specifically Canada, um, but I believe that I'll, I'm, I could I could look into it. Look into it. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Be well.